Hello and welcome to China Focus. I'm Shelley Zhang. On December 7th, the Canadian government approved a $15.1 billion takeover of Canadian company Nexen by Chinese company Sinook. Now, Sinook, that's the China National Offshore Oil Company, is one of China's three big oil companies. Now, the Sinook is owned by the Chinese government, and this has been the cause of major concerns among many Canadians and even Americans. Here today to talk about this, we have in the studio Matt Ganesda, and over Skype, we have Epic Times Parliament Hill reporter Matthew Little. Thank you both for joining us. Now, Matthew, the first question is for you. Now, the Canadian government, uh, when they said they approved the deal, they also said they would likely not approve future deals like this. Why do you think they they made that caveat? I think that there's uh, legitimate policy concerns there that the um, that the prime minister pointed to, namely that it's a relatively small group of companies that. Uh, control most of the production in the oil sands, and with a few key takeovers by state-owned enterprises, uh, foreign government would have an undue amount of uh, control of that specific sector of the economy. And it's it's a real important sector, especially for this government. So they don't want to lose that um, open market characteristic in the oil sands. Now, Matthew, you mentioned that this was a pretty divisive issue. Were there? Uh, did do you think the Canadian government addressed the concerns that people had about it, uh, or was there anything that they didn't address? Uh, there were so many uh, concerns that um, it would be very difficult to address all of them. I think they addressed the main concern of uh, many critics that effectively Canadian assets were being nationalized by foreign governments. But there were a lot of specific concerns to Sinook itself that the government effectively sidestepped by putting this bar on all foreign state-owned enterprises. And that has a lot to do with the nature of uh, who owns Sinook, which is the Chinese regime, and the abuses that Sinook is linked to in China and Burma, uh, in Tibet, where apparently the uh, Tibetans in, Can in Canada were protesting the takeover because they said Sinook directly, well, they funded in part the exile of Tibetan nomads and Falun Gong adherents in Canada were saying that Sinook security personnel arrested and detained practitioners in China and had them sent off to brainwashing facilities and detention centers. So the government doesn't address these types of concerns specifically. They don't raise any of the uh, human rights issues linked to Sinook, nor the espionage or influence concerns specific to Chinese state-owned oil companies. But that's always been uh, a characteristic of uh, just about any Canadian government in recent years to kind of overlook the nature of the Chinese regime in dealing with these types of issues. Okay, so Matt, I want to ask you, you know, what does it mean to be a state-owned company in China? Well, you know, Sinook, like other state-owned companies, are, you know, Sinook is a wholly, owned, uh, a wholly owned by the Chinese government, but the Chinese government is wholly run by the Chinese Communist Party. And so what it really means is that you have this, this very political organization, the, the party, which is controlling uh, all the state-owned oil industry. Sinook is not unique among all of them, but just to give you an idea of the degree of, of Communist Party control they have over these is that personnel decisions uh, are made by the Communist Party, not by the companies and not even by the government. I'll give an example. Um, in April 2011, there's, th there's three big uh, China state-owned oil companies. There's uh, PetroChina, Sinook, and Sinopec. And they basically, a year and a half ago, they did this very strange swap. The, the, uh, one of the heads of PetroChina became the head of Sinook. The head of Sinook became the head of Sinopec. And the head of Sinopec uh, became the governor of Fujian province. So, like, this is weird rotation. I mean, imagine, like, the U.S. government switching the heads of, you know, ExxonMobil and Chevron and Shell and just doing this rotation. That would never happen. But that's exactly what happened in China because the Communist Party controls all the major personnel decisions. And as a result, they keep those companies in line and they control their strategy. So there's definitely a sort of a party strategic thing behind it. And these decisions are made at the highest level. The, organ, the organization department, which is a, a Communist Party organ, is like the, a giant human resources department for the Communist Party. And the organization department basically um, makes these recommendations for you know, who should be in charge of what. And then the Politburo, the sort of highest, uh, you know, level 25 members that rule China, they approve these kind of decisions. So it's very much run by the party and the party makes 
personnel and strategic decisions for the company. It's a little different than what you'd get in, say, you know, a, a, com- a country like Norway, where it's just it's government owned, but they don't have that level of uh, political control. So you wouldn't have uh, like the the Norwegian government like take one of their CEOs from an oil company and make them like suddenly a government position, is what you're saying? Yeah, like you don't get that kind of weird swap like you do in an authoritarian uh, dictatorship like in China. Now, I want to ask um, both of you, and Matthew, maybe you can go first. If you think there's a higher strategic interest for uh, the Chinese government, for the Communist Party, in controlling uh, the Nexen and Canadian companies. Yeah, I guess that's that's the um, that's a big question that looms for a lot of critics of the steel. Is what is the long term strategy? Uh, I think that there is, of course, a, a real hope amongst uh, party officials that they can take this growing reserve of that they've got and uh, invested around the world in, in stable countries, stable democracies, places where that money would be relatively safe and uh, maybe not subject to the kind of turmoil that um, that China faces on an ongoing basis. At the same time, of course, energy is a, a, a backstone uh, to development and the, the regime needs it, needs that continued, those continued input to further its own development, economic development in China. But then, of course, there's this whole question of how closely these economic purchases are tied with foreign policy considerations. And I think that's where the, the long-term strategic value of uh, buying up major sectors in Canada or trying to purchase major uh, companies in Canada comes into play. And that's just how much of an ear you get to the Canadian government when you're a major player in, in a critical sector or a sector of specific uh, importance to this government. So, you know, that's really where I think a lot of the concerns of the government are as far as worried about what role uh, a certain state would play in Canada if it could dominate that sector. Yeah, and the U.S. government, you know, had a lot of these concerns as well. In 2005, CNUC put in a bid for Unical. The U.S. government blocked it. The U.S. government's been concerned about a number of uh, China state-owned takeovers. More recently... Huawei, a technology company, um, the U.S. government, uh, you know, issued a report uh, warning that there could be some issues um, with that. So, obviously, the U.S. government has some concerns. The U.S. government is also reviewing uh, this case itself because uh, Nexen has some holdings in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. It's got about 10, uh, you know, oil and natural gas platforms. Not a major part of the U.S. oil industry. It's, you know, less than 1%, but still the U.S. government is looking into it and if the U.S. government doesn't approve it, then Nexon will have to divest uh, in, in those assets. So there's definitely a concern um, in the U.S. government as well, which has seen just in general uh, in some sort of intelligence risks when it comes to uh, state on enterprises, at least in certain sectors. Now, CNUC as a company has agreed to um, follow certain strict rules when it comes to the Nexon takeover. They've uh, you know, agreed to a lot of transparency things. Uh, they've agreed to do a lot of things to kind of assuage some of these concerns about a, a Chinese state-owned company coming in. Is it still possible to kind of deny a company when they've basically like agreed to follow all these procedures? Oh, so the you know, so CNUC says, oh yeah, we're going to play by the rules, and we just believe them. Well, look at what the Chinese government did when it came to, for example, getting into the WTO. Oh yeah, we're going to follow the rules. You know, we get into the WTO, and then it, it, almost immediately they start skirting the rules as much as possible. Uh, you know, intellectual property, uh, you know, currency issues, uh, unfair, you know, subsidies. So clearly, uh, once you get in, you know, once Sino gets Nexon, it's very hard to make them pull out. So as long as they agree to play by the rules now, it's much harder to do anything to them if they decide to, you know, pull a WTO. And, and decide to you know, skirt the rules as much as they can get away with. Uh, so Matthew, we don't have a lot of time left, but I just want to ask you if you think the way the Canadian government addressed the Sinuk nexon uh, deal assuaged any of the concerns that people had uh, about it, and uh, you know, will this kind of open the door to more uh, you know, uh, Chinese investment in Canada? Uh, I'll take your second question first. I, you know, the Prime Minister effectively closed that door. He said this was the end of a trend rather than the beginning. And so from this point on, if they approve uh, any foreign state-owned enterprises taking a controlling interest in a Canadian company, it would really contradict that, that position. 
So whether the Chinese regime tries to find other ways to kind of circumvent that restriction is unknown. Uh, maybe they could go through third parties or uh, maybe it would open the door for Chinese companies that aren't state-owned to further invest in Canada. Who knows? But as far as that goes, I think that unless something dramatic happens to change that position, no, that's not the case. Uh, for the first question, public reaction has been really divided on this. People are very critical of the government for allowing the deal that were critical to begin with, while those that wanted the deal are critical for the government for closing that door. So those concerns that the critics had haven't really changed. There's not been anything really there to say that uh, CNUC isn't going to do some of the things they're concerned about it doing as far as environmental uh, degradation or human rights abuses that it's engaged in in other places continuing or possibly even coming into Canada with uh, practices that would be um, not desired here. So it's, it's, uh, it's no, I wouldn't say that the that people are necessarily eased by that restriction on future investment coming in from state-owned enterprises. Matt, really quickly, do you think this will affect the U.S.? I think that once CNUC gets a foothold in Canada, it's a little easier for uh, certain interests to argue that it's okay for Chinese state-owned enterprises to enter the U.S. or other uh, Western countries. But it's also unclear. It also depends on, on sort of how CNUC behaves. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Well, we're out of time today, so thank you for joining us, and thank you, Matthew, for joining us from Ottawa. And for more on this and other issues in China, join us at ntd.tv.